welcome to our webinar. Today's topic is HIV among American Indians and Alaska Natives, as well as understanding HIV cure research. Today's webinar is uh, in honor of the National Native HIV Awareness Day, March 20th, and is brought to you by the Urban Indian Health Institute, Seattle Indian Health Board, and Defeat HIV. And now, I would like to introduce you to Bill Hall. Good morning. My name is Bill Hall, and I am a Clinket Indian from Southeast Alaska and a member of the Raven Clan. I can't tell you what an exciting day this is, not only for me, but for the group bringing this event to you as well, to feed HIV. We have been trying for several years to bring this event to the Seattle Indian Health Board, and thanks to Abigail Echohawk, the recently appointed Executive Director of the Urban Indian Health Institute, we are finally able to do so. She has not only been supportive of our event, she and her team, Leah Dodge and Adrian Dominguez, worked closely with us to make this event happen. So many thanks to Abigail and her team. It is also appropriate that this event happened today, March 20th, which is the National Native American HIV AIDS Awareness Day. A little bit of trivia here. March 20th was chosen because it falls on the spring equinox, and those who set the dates for National, Na National HIV AIDS Awareness Days thought it would be very native to choose March 20th as the National HIV Native American HIV AIDS Awareness Day, as spring represents new life and hope. The talk we will be having today is how HIV affects the Native community and the research that the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center is doing to cure HIV AIDS. The group that I work with, the Feed HIV, is a community advisory board consisting of people from all walks of life that work with the researchers at Fred Hutch, providing community input when needed for their research. And we go into the community and sponsor events such as this to educate the community on cure research. More importantly, we let these communities know that for endeavors such as ours to succeed, it is going to take every community affected by HIV AIDS to become involved in the search for a cure, including the Native community. We want to take a moment here to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the people known as the Duwamish tribe, the people of Chief Seattle, the first people of the city of Seattle, Mercer Island, Renton, Bellevue, Tukwila, and much of King County, Washington. We also acknowledge that they have never left their ancestral homeland. Our first presenter is Abigail Eckerhawk, the Executive Director of the Urban Indian Health Institute. Well, good morning or afternoon, whatever coast you happen to be on, and welcome to this webinar on HIV and AIDS in American Indian Alaska Natives. Um, we are very excited to be partnering with Fred Hutchinson to bring this information on cure HIV to all of you. Um, too often in our communities we hear more about the disparities and less about the hope and the strength and the resiliencies that are going on not only in our own communities but in the research world as we look at addressing things like HIV AIDS in our communities. It is an imperative that we as indigenous people be part of that. Um, as said before, my name is Abigail Echohawk. I'm an enrolled member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. I am also a member of the Upper Atha Athabascan people of Mintasta Lake, Alaska. And I'm the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute, and we are very pleased to bring today um, this presentation. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute. Um, we are formed and funded by the um, Indian Health Service as part of the tribal epidemiological centers, um, and we are a little bit unique in that we're one of 12, but we are the only one that is a national organization 
because we are looking at the 71% of American Indians and Alaska Natives who no longer live um, on reservation or in their villages or on tribal lands, but rather have come to the urban centers for a multitude of different reasons, from relocation to seeking out new job opportunities. But I, like many others, while I identify as an urban Indian, I was also born and raised in the heart of Alaska and also identify with my tribal community. So while many of us do live off reservation, we are also connected and tied to our communities across the country. UIHI was established in 2000, and the mission is to support the health and well-being of urban Indian communities through information, scientific inquiry, and technology. And so today, our partnership with the Fred Hutch is bringing you um, our goal, which is really to change the health and well-being of our Native communities. And just to kind of give you an idea of how widespread our programs are, um, we currently work with 34 different urban Indian health-serving organizations across the country. Along with UIHI is the evaluator for the CDC's Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country, and we're working with a multitude of different tribal nations across the country, um, including Alaska. So I'm going to pass this on to um, one of our lead epidemiologists, Leah Dodge, who will introduce herself and then talk a little bit about the health disparities around HIV AIDS in the urban and also rural Native communities. Thank you. We're so excited to have you all as part of this webinar. Thanks, Abigail. I'm Leah Dodge. I'm a project coordinator epidemiologist at the Urban Indian Health Institute, and I'm an enrolled member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. Um, so I'm going to give a really quick overview of HIV AIDS and American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, in 2015, the rate of HIV and AIDS diagnoses was higher in American Indians and Alaska Natives than in whites. Um, but here it's really important to mention that racial misclassification, which is when an AIAN person is often classified as white in their healthcare record, um, definitely plays a role here, most likely making the actual number of diagnoses in AIAN and therefore the rate higher than what is reported here in these numbers. From 2010 to 2014, the number of HIV diagnoses in AIAN increased by 19%, and this number increased by 63% among AIAN gay and bisexual men. And in 2012, of the 3,800 AIAN estimated to be living with HIV, an estimated 19% were undiagnosed. This is compared to 13% of all persons living with HIV in the United States. So who does HIV AIDS affect? Of the estimated 170 HIV diagnoses among AIN men nationally in 2014, most were from male-to-male -male sexual contact. And among the estimated 49 HIV diagnoses in AIAN women in 2014, the mode of transmission was heterosexual contact. Um, and in 2013, both female and male AIN had the highest percentage of estimated diagnoses of HIV infection attributed to injection drug use compared with all other races and ethnicities. So even though it's a pretty small percentage here, um, it is um, the highest number attributed to injection drug use. And so living with an HIV diagnosis, from 2006 to 2011, of any racial group, AIAN had the lowest survival 36 months after an HIV diagnosis. Um, this lower survival rate also holds true um, for AIDS diagnoses. And in 2013, 53% of AIAN with HIV were retained in care compared to 58% of whites. Fewer AIAN also achieved viral suppression compared to whites. Then there are several challenges to care. Um, so STDs, um, which are a prevention challenge, from 2011 to 2015, AIANs had the second highest rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea among all racial and ethnic groups, and having another STD increases a person's risk for transmitting HIV or getting HIV. Um, there's a lack of awareness, um, there's stigma, which we are talking about today, which is really exciting. 
Um, there's cultural diversity. There are over 560 federally recognized tribes. And because each tribe has its own culture, beliefs, and practices, creating culturally appropriate prevention programs for each group can be challenging. However, I think there are a lot of opportunities here to harness the strengths of AIAN people, and the Urban Indian Health Institute is really excited to be working in this area. And as I mentioned earlier, there are issues with racial misclassification, which is a significant data limitation. Um, but we're really excited to be here today to talk about um, the different ways we can work together to defeat HIV. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Smitty now. Hi. Thank you, Leah. So the rest of our webinar will be devoted to helping everyone understand what is going on in the field of HIV cure research. The field is a new one, and it uh, creates a lot of questions, uh, especially because a lot of people don't know the science or don't even understand um, how we've come to this place. And so hopefully today you will be getting some of that. Before we go on, though, uh, I'd like to introduce ourselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Smitty first. Uh, my name is Smitty Buckler. Um, I grew up in eastern Washington, um, and I am an unenrolled member of the Choctaw Tribe, and um, I'm also Irish, and probably a lot of other things, so I'm kind of a little bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm Michael. I am the Defeat HIV CAB coordinator, and there is my email if you have any questions during this uh, presentation that you don't get answered while we're here, please feel free to email me afterwards. I was born in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, and my makeup is uh, Italian and Russian, Catholic and Jewish, all of the sort of combined uh, efforts of my forebearers that have brought me to this place today. Um, I work for Defeat HIV. Uh, Defeat HIV has been around now for at least seven years, and we are federally funded to work on HIV cure research. We are a public and a private research group, meaning that we have public institutions as well as private corporations working together devoted to trying to cure HIV, and our housing institution is the Fred Hutch here in Seattle, Washington. Our leaders are Drs. Keith Jerome and Hans Peter Keen, and they've assembled a very powerful team of scientists that are at the forefront of HIV, bone marrow, stem cell transplants, and cell and gene therapy. And why have they uh, gathered this team? The one goal is to develop innovative ways to cure HIV infection. And what inspires us? Well, HIV cure research gets its inspiration from the unique case of a man who was born in Seattle. His name is Timothy Ray Brown, and he is the first and still un uh, unfortunately only person considered cured of HIV. And we are a part of a CAB. You heard us use that word CAB. And what is a CAB? Well, most of you, when you hear the word CAB, might be thinking about taxis, but that's not what we mean when we say CAB. What we mean by CAB is community advisory board. And what is a community advisory board? Well, it's a group of representatives that represent the public who meet with the researchers and scientists of a group. And the whole idea behind that is that they relay information between the two groups. So you have community on the one side and research on the other. And the CAB is made up of volunteers that are sort of bridging the gaps between the scientists and the communities affected by HIV. Um, which is really why we need all sorts of people to get involved with a CAB so we can have all sorts of viewpoints uh, relayed into the research. So I'd like to start off by welcoming you all to join us. You don't have to wear a lab coat to help us find a cure for HIV. You just need to show up and come as you are. So what we hope to learn today, um, we want to think about different ways to think about an HIV cure, um, why it is difficult to cure HIV, and rationale for exploring a cure, and then the current cure strategies that are being researched. So think of it for a moment. You probably may have heard, if you read anything in the news or if you're online, you've probably heard some things. So what do you think of when you hear HIV cure? There's so many things that you could be thinking of, but the most important thing is to realize that there is still no cure for HIV. It's exciting that we're working on research toward an HIV cure, but currently there is no cure. 
But if you are involved in any of the media, there's so much hype around it, you might not believe that. Um, you may have seen some of these headlines, uh, cure within months, and then a baby is being cured. And then we even have other people who have something crazy called a functional cure. And then these are other headlines, HIV-free patients. Could B venom be the cure that we're looking for? Um, we have pills to prevent and cure HIV. Then you hear about the baby now having HIV again, and the people who were HIV-free, the HIV comes back, and there's cure setbacks. And then you hear more about these, oh, finding new cures. If you follow any of this, that's the real news. Then if you're on Facebook or other media sources, you see things like this, black seeds shown to cure HIV in a study. Well, didn't you know, and now you do. That is entirely not true. You also have people like Dr. Sebi here, who you can't see his face in that picture, but he has videos on YouTube that he says that he can cure everything from HIV to diabetes and cancer. And if you've uh, followed any of the uh, things that are online, you may have heard about this certain patent of an HIV cure, which people use to say that a cure already exists. The patent is a patent that works, uh, that is real, but it does not work as a cure. So you can make a patent for anything, but you can't necessarily, a patent doesn't say that necessarily something works. So what do you do with all this hype? Well, you have to protect your heart because when you hear these things, you really have to realize that oftentimes uh, headlines are designed to be clickbait, to get you to click on it so they can drive numbers to their website or to their posts. So really, you should be looking, when you read anything, look for scientists who are not involved in the supposed study that you're reading about to see what they say. And really, be skeptical about any reports making claims about timelines. There's probably not going to be a cure for HIV within months, probably not within even a number of years. Anyone who gives you timelines, really, you should question that. Also, you should see if the report bothers to quote or give you any of the original science uh, whether it's the original paper or the presentation, and they cite that, because that will be a good sign that this is real science as opposed to something that might be misunderstood. Um, and if you were reporting on HIV cure, you would really want to say HIV cure research, because at this date, we don't have a cure. It's all still just in the research stage. What do we mean when we say cure? <clears throat> Uh, no need for ongoing medication, um, antiretroviral treatment, no symptoms, no viral progression, immune damage, and no risk of transmission. If you had all of these elements, you would have what people are calling a functional cure for HIV. It's called functional because HIV might still be in the body, but your life would be unaffected by it. Just like most people are unaffected by the chickenpox virus that continues to live in your body after you have chickenpox except for older immune-compromised people who get, might get shingles. Some people think we should use the term remission to describe this, similar to the term used in cancer when the body stops producing cancer cells for a long, prolonged period after treatment. The hope is that this remission would last many years, for decades. Some people think that a cure should also repair damage already done to the body as a consequence of having HIV, such as rebuilding the strength of the immune system or reducing inflammatory damage. Just like when someone quits smoking, not only, does it, not only does the risk of future disease improve, but lung damage can actually be reversed. And a person's ability to breathe may be improved and their cough reduced. Some people think a cure should make you immune from future HIV infections. This could, could potentially be the case with some gene therapy options being explored. So what is the language of cure? Sterilization or eradication, um, that means that the HIV is completely removed from every cell in the body, that the person is HIV free, aka virus free. And then there's functional remission, when HIV is not completely gone from the body. All requirements from the previous slides have been met and HIV has the potential to resurface. So for today's, today's purpose, when I say cure, I'm referring to, or when we say cure, we're referring to all of these possibilities. Some strategies being pursued today are more likely to lead to functional cure or remission. Some may lead to a sterilized cure. We will discuss a number of strategies being proposed in just a few minutes. First, we're gonna ponder for a moment about why is curing HIV so difficult. In this 
slide is kind of a, a visual image of uh, what HIV looks like in the, bot, in the body. So that one tool up there that's not purple would be the HIV. Um, so when the, mute, when the immune cell is on patrol but has not recognized a familiar pathogen, it is called resting or not active or reproducing itself. The cells aren't sending out any signal for destruction. During this time, HIV appears to not be doing anything either. The rest of the immune system can't see it because it's hiding inside the body's own cell. The ARVs or antiretrovirals can't find it either for the same reason. Not only are these cells hard to find because they are not sending out signals, they are also hard to find because there are, are a variety of these reservoir cells in the body. Right, and so in this picture, they say one out of every million cells has HIV. So just imagine how hard it would be to find that one cell that would have the HIV in it when you look at those flowers. So why is HIV so hard to cure? HIV enters a cell and integrates into the cell's DNA. Most cells recognize infection-causing cell death. Few in a few infected cells become long-lived memory cells or resting memory cells. The collection of long-lived memory cells is called the latent reservoir. So here we have a chart just to show you what it looks like when someone is infected. So at the beginning of the chart there, when someone first is infected, it spikes really high. The viral load, as we say, the numbers of virus in someone's blood spikes up high, and then it sort of goes down a little bit but establishes a set point and then continues on. And then when someone tests, they discover they have HIV, and then they can start antiretroviral therapy. And when they start their therapy, the uh, viral load decreases, and hopefully it gets to that point where we say below the limit of detection, which means they still have HIV, but we can no longer really detect it with the normal tests that we use for HIV. And provided that they stay on their medicines every day, taking their medicine every day, they will be able to keep that undetectable um, viral load. But if they stop taking that, from the moment they stop, probably two to four weeks afterwards, that viral load will spike again, and then HIV will return into the body. So that is one of the reasons why HIV is so hard to cure. We can suppress it in the blood, but we can't necessarily get it out of the cells. So some of you may have heard of these reservoirs that we're talking about, the places where HIV hides out in the body and where the antiretroviral therapy can't find it. Once HIV enters an immune cell, which you'll see that as the blue cell there, it integrates into the cell DNA. And the cell's control center, that's the cell's control center for reproducing itself. It hijacks the cell's replication process, getting the cell to make more virus particles instead of more cells. Most cells realize that they are infected, which is like the yellow cell there, and so they will die or they'll send out a chemical signal to be killed. But sometimes these cells turn into resting memory cells. Long-lived memory cells, which are CD4 uh, T cells, help the body fight off foreign invaders that have already been seen. Long-lived memory cells act like police, patrolling with a most wanted list. So here is a chart just for you all to realize there's a lot of cells of the immune system, and it all starts with our stem cells, which then become all these different cells of the body. The majority of the reservoir is made up of long-lived memory CD4 cells, sometimes called resting memory cells. These cells are part of your immune system that call for help and turn on the rest of your immune system to fight the infection. HIV gets into the other cells as well. Um, uh, some of the cells on this, but we will skip over that for now. So where is the HIV in most people's bodies? It's everywhere, unfortunately. We uh, have evidence that HIV gets into the brain, into the lymph nodes, into the peripheral blood, the blood that's coursing throughout your body, really in the gut, in your bone marrow, and even in the genital tract. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how can the reservoir be measured? Um, the reservoir size will vary from person to person. That much we can deduce. And there'll be different factors for this. Uh, some of that might be genetic, um, but also what might uh, really play a big part of that is when someone started antiretroviral therapy and how long was the, their, or how high was their viral load during their exposure. All these things will influence the size of the reservoir.
Um, so we've been trying to take samples from some tissues of people to sort of measure the reservoir of HIV, but some of these tissues are difficult to get because of their location, especially in places like the spleen or the brain. So currently, unfortunately, there is no standard test that we have that can measure accurately the HIV reservoir, and that is one of the challenges that is facing scientists in terms of uh, curing HIV, is actually measuring how much HIV someone has throughout the entire body and then we would know how to get rid of it. So why do we need a cure? Um, this is a very, very interesting question because only people who live without HIV in their bodies really ask it. Um, why do we need a cure? Well, there's some very, very good reasons. We need a cure because there's a great disparity in the access to care that people experience nationally here in the U.S. as well as globally. Um, there are about 37 million people who have HIV in this world, and still it's only about half of them that even have access to the medicines that can keep them healthy for the rest of their lives. And even if they do have access to those medicines, there is a burden in taking those pills every day. The pills have to be taken every day, and they have to be taken for the rest of your life, and that can be quite a burden. For someone who feels otherwise healthy, the pills can be a daily reminder of illness. And not everyone is good about remembering to take pills every day. Besides that, there's also the side effects that happen from the medicines. These can include uh, strains on the liver, strains on the kidney, and even changes in physical appearance. Um, sometimes there are sort of uh, uh, side effects that affect your gut and others. But the biggest one, and if any one of you is out there living with HIV, you can really attest to this, is the expense. HIV is expensive and treating HIV is expensive. Depending on how a cure is priced and subsidized, it could be more cost effective to cure people than to treat them for life. So what has started all of this? Well, we have what we call in science a proof of concept. We have this one person who's been cured of HIV and Timothy Ray Brown was cured in, of HIV on February 7th, 2007. He was living in Berlin and he developed leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia. And to get that treated, he needed a bone marrow stem cell transplant. And the doctor who was treating him remembered from his days back in medical school that some people on this earth are naturally resistant to HIV. They don't their cells don't form the receptor that HIV needs to get into the cell. And when they have that trait from both their mother and their father, they have cells that are highly resistant to HIV infection. We call that a homozygous CCR5 Delta 32. And Timothy was lucky. He had a lot of donors to choose from that genetically matched him for his leukemia treatment. So the doctor had a brilliant idea. He looked through that list and he looked for someone who might also have the CCR5 Delta 32 uh, mutation, and he found one. And so Timothy went through a course of chemo and radiotherapy uh, conditioning, and then he had an allogeneic stem cell transplant with these donor cells that were resistant to HIV. And 68 days later, after that first transplant, they could find no more replicating HIV in his body. And that was 10 years ago. He still remains cured. In fact, we had him here in Seattle to celebrate his 10th birthday um, of being cured. And there is a picture of him blowing out his candle and of many of our community members around him singing happy birthday to him. So here, just to show you the reality of it, is the doctor, Gero Hooter, with Timothy. Um, the HIV cure that he's experienced is real and it's been lasting and it's what inspires us to go on and try to make this accessible to more people. So next we're going to talk about some strategies that are currently being explored. Um, one of the most common ones uh, that you might have heard about is called kick and kill or shock and kill. The main component of the strategy is basically determine how to wake up the virus. We were talking about the reservoirs uh, earlier, so we want to wake up the virus that's in those reservoirs 
by stimulating the cell enough to begin producing virus so that they can be identified. So kick and kill is a two-step process. Uh, it stimulate, stimulates the virus production from the latent cells and then kills the virus particles outside of the cell and infected cells. Uh, this is kind of an image of it. If you can see the little blue uh, squiggle inside of the blue cell, um, that's the HIV. Uh, and then the LRA stands for latency reversing agent, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But you can see how then the cell wakes up and starts producing new virus, and then the cell gets killed. So latency reversing agents is the category of drugs that stimulates HIV infection HIV-infected long-term memory cells to begin producing viruses. Uh, Latency-reversing agents act like most wanted pathogens, waking up the resting memory cells. They are a class of drugs that stimulate resting memory cells to produce virus again, making it findable so that it can be targeted for destruction. One of these drugs that are being successfully that are successfully being used in cancer treatment are what are known as HDAC inhibitors. These are the first, furthest along in testing and are in phase one human safety trials for people with HIV. So some of our challenges are getting a measurement of the reservoir size and knowing that we've gotten it all, new reservoirs, and also medication side effects. Uh, the first challenge is measurement. The reservoirs are hard to find and hard to measure. How do we know if we have found all the cells containing the reservoir? How much difference does the size of the reservoir make? There's a lot of work going on to figure out measurements. Another unknown is how do we know if we are killing all of the HIV that has been released without it creating or reseeding the reservoirs? What will the body's response be to new HIV from reservoirs being released? What are the side effects of uh, LRAs? Current HDAC inhibitors are known to have significant side effects. What are the side effects of waking up the sleeping memory cells? Let's also take a moment to talk about immune mod modulation. What are immune modulators? Um, they are a category of research that harnesses the innate and adaptive immune system to better recognize and or fight HIV. All immune modulators would likely, would likely need to be used in combination with, uh, with each other or with other approaches. Uh, so innate immunity, just so to clarify, is no specific response, the first line of defense like skin. Adaptive immunity targets, is a targeted response to specific pathogens, creating a whole army dedicated to attacking one enemy. Another idea is to use the strengthened immune system, possibly in combination with other strategies, such as uh, LRAs or genetic modification, and possibly by itself. Immune modulators refer to any type of drug or procedure that causes some type of sustained change in the immune system. They can change the immune system to f better fight the virus. This includes both identifying the long-lived cells holding the virus before activation and killing infected cells and the virus once the long-lived cells have been reactivated. Therapeutic vaccines, um, is, we're gonna talk to them next. Uh, rationale uh, is that it strengthens or create new and more effective immune responses to HIV in people living with HIV. Also, uh, to generate long-lived adaptive immune responses to HIV that can continue to control the virus without medication. So another approach is using these th therapeutic vaccines um, to prime the immune system to identify and kill HIV more effectively. A number of therapeutic vaccines have been tested in large-scale human trials, while others are in early phases of testing. A candidate vaccine has been identified for testing in combination with cell and gene therapy approaches. And let me interrupt here. Um, one of the exciting things that just recently came out from a conference that was held here in Seattle uh, back in February um, was that in Spain, they've had much success using what they call a conserved elements vaccine, and that actually helped produce um, a, a post-treatment control in five people. So it's still very early, but it was some exciting news as a small pilot study that uh, warrants further attention. So this stuff is already getting into humans. So one of these therapeutic vaccines um, is 
fondly known as BNABs, or broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, BNABs are able to make many different mutations of HIV harmless by binding to one of three places on HIV. BNABs are currently being explored for use in not only HIV prevention and treatment, or, it, but also cure. So all three of those, uh, prevention, treatment, and cure. Uh, one approach to immune modulation is using the BNABs, um, which can bind to a wide variety of HIV mutations and kill the virus. Researchers are looking into mechanisms to facilitate the body's ability to make effective broadly neutral antibodies, as well as develop new antibodies to administer as part of com a combination. In the absence of ARVs, the immune system will try and adapt to HIV by continually developing the two antibodies to fight virus, while the virus is continually developing ways to escape. These escapes are mutations. The body develops broadly neutralizing antibodies naturally after long exposure to the virus to fight against the variety of mutations. They are usually not effective enough to control HIV on their own. New advances in this field have led to the creation of a variety of BNAVs with potency and breadth breadth against HIV. Some of these trials are um, preclinical lab and animal studies, um, and some are in the early human trial stages. So some current challenges of immune modulation um, is there's a pot potential for therapeutic misconception, people thinking there's a benefit when there is none. Complex regulatory issues because each component will need to be evaluated separately and in combination. Animal models do not always translate to humans. And providing that strict immune control of HIV is clinically equivalent or better than ART. Next, we're going to talk about gene editing for a second. Gene editing is a process to edit the DNA inside immune cells in some way that make the cells less susceptible to HIV. A process to edit the DNA inside immune cells to increase the killing potential of the cell. A process to, end, to edit the DNA inside the virus to reduce its ability to impact people. So there's several different approaches that involve either altering, altering, altering the genes of the body or the gene of the virus that are at different stages of research. The idea is that is to alter genes to make the body resistant to HIV, strengthen the body's ability to fight HIV, or weaken HIV's ability to do its job of infecting and killing cells without causing other harm to the body. A way to think about this is like using molecular scissors to cut out a specific section of the gene of the virus or a particular cell and sew in a replacement section that makes the gene direct the virus or the cell to act differently. In this uh, image, you see an orange gene inside the cell is the target for the vector in the gene modification tool. The capsule or the vector outside of the cell enters, carrying a, yellow, a new yellow gene and a gene modification tool, the Pac-Man. The gene modification cuts the target gene and the new gene is inserted in its place. So HIV needs a receptor, CCR5, to be present on all cell surfaces in order to enter the cell and cause damage. Zinc fingers, molecular scissors used in to edit genes are one of the main tools being explored in clinical research. Um, so this uh, Creating HIV immunity, this uh, slide is going to show the process in use in current gene cell therapy clinical trials. The immune cells, either the T cells or the hematopic stem cells that are to be the gene modified, are mobilized in the patient's body with drugs. Either sorted from the patient's blood through leukophorus or harvested from the patient's bone marrow. The stem cells harvest from the bone marrow or T cells harvested through the leukophoresis are isolated into a pure population. The therapeutic gene is transferred to the, into the DNA of the target cell using a viral vector or non-viral technology. The gene modified cells are then re-infused back into the patient. So this leukophoresis is the process of harvesting white blood cells directly from the body. Two tubes are paced into the body and con connected 
to a large filter machine. The blood is pumped out of the body using this filter machine. White blood cells are caught and harvested while red blood cells are returned to the body using the second tube. This process requires large blood volume and can be expensive to perform. Okay, so now on to some challenges. One is to assure that only target on-target modifications are made. Um, it is unknown how much modification is needed to produce the benefit, uh, the therapeutic threshold. And development of potential immunity to the current to the tools used to make gene alteration occur. And then current cost instability. We have to make sure that the only challenges being made are the ones that we want to make. You do not want a different part of the gene than the part that we are targeting to be changed. Studies are checking for off-target changes. We know little about how much the genetically modified cells will take over or how much they will need to take over to be effective. Others have concerns about anything related to modifying genes, given negative social history related to eugenics. We do not know what the side effects of some of these challenges will be, as some of these approaches are still in very early testing. Besides all of the science, there are some ethical challenges when we come to cure HIV, and I'd like to review those with you now. So what are these? Well, for all the approaches being looked at to cure HIV, cost and scalability are great concerns. Right now, they are expensive and most will require advanced labs and technology. Some researchers are already working on how to make these approaches less expensive and less technologically complex so they will ultimately be scalable. It is unlikely that any cure technology will be able to immediately deli be delivered worldwide. However, some uh, however, keeping that goal in mind, it is important from the beginning uh, to be working on the scalability at the same time as we produce these products, and that should lead to a faster global diffusion. There are a number, number of ethical challenges related to conducting HIV research. One challenge is about resource al allocation. In a world where we know people could potentially live long, healthy lives with HIV if they were on treatment, but not everyone has access to treatment, should those resources be devoted to cure research, or should they be better spent on making treatments more available, or even on preventing new infections? It's a question to think about. There's another ethical challenge that's related to risk. In the beginning of the epidemic, being in a treatment trial was the best way to have access to a new medicine that might help you live longer or healthier. You were probably going to die relatively soon if the new product didn't work. This is not the case with HIV cure research. In order to know if a cure method works, it will need to be studied in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. Is it ethical to ask people who might be able to live relatively healthy lives for many years or even decades on their medications to go off those medications as a part of a cure trial and risk their HIV infection getting worse and possibly making them sick to see if a new cure approach works? So we have all of these issues around the ethics of the trials that we're trying to do. Another great ethical concern is making sure that all people are equally represented in HIV, no matter of their sex or their gender or their race or their ethnicity. We need all sorts of people who live with HIV to be included in trials, and that means the recruitment for these people needs to be funded and scaled up so we can reach the people, and that includes American Indians and Native Alaskans. But ultimately, what does an HIV cure need to be? Well, these are kind of simple, but we need it to be safe. We need a cure to be effective. We need it to last a long time or be a durable cure. We also need it to be affordable. It would really be a cry and shame to have an HIV cure that is too expensive for people to access. And then we have to last make sure that it is, it is accessible to every person on this earth who needs it. So from our presentation, you're probably getting a sense that the bar for curing HIV is really high. We're going to have to do that high jump and we're going to have to practice at it probably to get there. It's not going to be something that's easily done. Uh, it won't be done in months. It's going to take years and years of science and then of other work implementing the cure to make sure that HIV is defeated.
But a simple way of thinking of it, cure, we need compassion to cure people. And we need to also have understanding and research, lots and lots of research. But ultimately, to get to a cure, we need everyone to be involved. And yes, I mean everyone. Uh, it's going to be through the participation of people living with HIV especially that will help us get to a cure, but there will be no cure if we do not have them involved. And so if you are living with HIV, I would just love to take a moment to really uh, sort of have you consider getting involved in the work towards a cure, whether that's as a trial participant or a CAB member, or even as just a concerned community member, that you all sort of think about this as the new frontier. We have one person cured of HIV, and if we have one person, that means we can have more people. We just need to figure out how to do it in a safe and effective manner. So there will be no cure without you. As a little plug, here in Seattle, we have a group that meets the first Tuesday of the month. We have dinner and a meeting where we talk about the issues around the research going on here in Seattle, and I'd like to invite you all to join us. You can call in. If you're interested in that, you can send me an email, and we can give you the call-in option so you can follow along from wherever you might be around the world. Also, if you want to get involved but don't want to necessarily commit any time, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, or on YouTube, especially on YouTube, where we post a lot of our videos of our events, where you will actually get to see Timothy Ray Brown talking. You will get to meet Gero Hooter, the doctor who cured him. You will get to see other scientists talking about their work in HIV cure, as well as other community members and their work as advocates for an HIV cure. Because remember, it's going to take you plus a lot of research to defeat HIV. I also just wanted to give an acknowledgement for all the people who helped us with these slides. Um, and there you can see them, especially the people at the University of Montreal, the University of California in San Francisco, the John Hopkins University, as well as the CARE Collaboratory, which is one of our sister sites in the University of North Carolina. And uh, that's bringing us to the end of our webinar here. And so I just wanted to say thank you all for tuning in. I'm just going to end us with this last thought. And that thought is, may a cure for HIV come within our lifetime, and may it be accessible to all people. And so if you have any questions that come to you after this, please feel free to send an email to mluella at fredhutch.org. And if you're interested in other information on cure, you can also go to a website uh, that AVAC puts up and look for their cure curriculum, where they will have lots of other slides that will teach you more about the intricacies of HIV cure research. And now I'll turn it back over to Abigail Echohawk. I want to thank you all for participating in this webinar, and a big thanks to our partners at the Fred Hutch and the Defeat HIV Community Advisory Board. Without the work of Michael, and I really appreciate the work of Bill Hall, really bringing an elder's perspective to the work that we are doing at the Urban Indian Health Institute. As part of that and through our partnership with them, we are very excited to announce the launch today of an HIV survey. Um, we are going to be assessing HIV attitudes, knowledge, and resources to American Indians and Alaska Natives across the country, whether they be living in rural or in urban settings. Um, and we are really excited to begin to be part of working towards the cure, and part of that it really means that we have to reach out to our American Indian and Alaska Native relatives, bring them into the conversation, and ensure that their voices and their stories are heard, because it's when our stories are ignored or not present that we can't and are no longer part of the conversations, we know that our people begin to suffer health disparities. It's the goal of the Urban Indian Health Institute to combat that through collaborations and partners like our work here with the Fred Hutchinson Institute. So if you are interested in our HIV survey, if you work with American Indians or Alaska Natives, or an American Indian or Alaska Native community member yourself, please reach out to us and email us at info at uihi.org and we will send you the link to the survey. Um, we'll be working in the next couple of months to get that survey, and we'll also be disseminating the results of that afterwards. Um, again, I would just like to thank you all for participating and for recognizing that the voices of American Indians and Alaska Native people are important. 
and that we need to be getting all the information that we can so that we can be part of searching and part of the cure. Thank you. It's really great to see that our relatives, our First Nation relatives in Canada, are developing a community advisory board. Um, like I said, we're so lucky to have Bill working with us here and then as having that native voice on the community advisory board for Defeat HIV. Um, so I'm so glad to hear that you guys are doing that and feel free to share any lessons learned with us as you go ahead and do that. Um, and that was from Chad Dickey. All right, so um, again, feel free to reach out to us at info at uihi.org. You got Michael's information and we um, can send out the slides if you would also like to see those and be able to share those with your community members. This webinar was recorded and will be posted on um, the Defeat HIV site and also on the YouTube that Michael um, mentioned. Thank you all. Have a great morning, afternoon, whatever coast you're on. And the UIHI will be working to do more um, webinars like this, so we hope to see you participate in the future. Yeah.